بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نستعين به ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونستجيره ونستهديه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله فإنه من هدى الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل الله فلا هادي له ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو ملك السماوات والأرض الحمد لله As you all know, what unites us is that singular word, Allah. The one and only God of existence consciousness and all that is good the God of salvation the God of existence subhanallah there is of the all the religious creed, creeds that humanity has known All the creeds before Islam, with their intricate systems of mythology and accumulative, accumulative narratives, and the creeds that came after Islam, even those like the Baha'i Creed and others that picked certain elements or were inspired by certain elements that they borrowed from Islam. There is no simpler creed than the Creed of Islam. There is no more straightforward and unadulterated creed than the creed of Islam. This is why precisely we say that it is the creed of intuition and fitra. Because intuition tells us that there is a God and that this God is singular and unified and immutable and is not subject to the same laws of creation because anything subject to the same laws of creation by definition would take us back to the systems of belief that humanity has known for long in the forms of paganism and mythology. When we say that God is the first cause, what is meant by that is that God is the first cause of the created world, the uncreated world, to the extent that it exists in and through God, is something that we do not have access to and cannot have access to. We dwell in a world that is limited 
by the very material and substance of existence and the very laws of existence. It is quite, it is remarkable that since Islam came to existence, and for a Muslim, Islam doesn't come to existence with the Prophet Muhammad Islam. Islam came to existence even before the Prophet Ibrahim. We know that the Prophet Idris, for instance, conveyed the same message from Allah. And that all the prophets that descended from Abraham, Ibrahim, Ibrahim, had reminded humanity time and time again that you have a creator and that that creator is intimately involved in everything you say or do. Time and again, the creed of the prophets, whether before the Prophet Ibrahim salam or after the Prophet Ibrahim salam keeps remind, keep reminding us that your <coughs> existence is not a coincidence, it is not a mistake, that you are of God, from God, and to God. That is the basic, fundamental, quintessential message. You are of God, from God, and to God. And that everything you do, and everything you say, and all behavior that comes from you during your existence on earth is intimately connected with and intimately involved with your divine maker. You cannot separate yourself from your divine maker even when you deny your divine maker and ignore your divine maker. In Islamic theology, we know that human beings, because of their own egoism and their own weaknesses, find the simple, straightforward message consistently difficult to live up to. Time and again, Human beings take this simple message and mythologize it and complicate it in numerous ways. From the ancient tribes of Israel that received the message of Moses and what Moses taught, as perhaps we'll talk about, is very simple. It's all there in its essence, not its in particulars, but in its essence. It's all there in the Old Testament. <clears throat> that there is but one God. You are from God, and you are to God, and to God you will return. When Moses, for instance, says Shema Israel, Adonai Yahweh, Adonai Achad, listen, Israel, Adonai Yahweh, God, your God is Yahweh, is God. Adonai Achad, 
your God is one. That's in the, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4, verse 4. This, of course, reminds us very closely to Qul Allahu Ahad. Say, but Allah is one. Adonai Ahad, the God is one. And we repeat this all the time in Qul Allahu Ahad. But we know from historians, it is well settled in history, it is well settled in historical writings that even the Israelites found, ultimately, found that simple, straightforward message of Adonai Yahweh, Adonai Achad, your God is but God, and your God is one. The simple message of Qul Allahu Ahad. Difficult to follow, and if you read in the history of the ancient Israelites, you find that paganism became extremely widespread. Paganism, even till the time that Jesus appears, is intimately interconnected with the history of the Israelites. Some of this paganism is still documented by the Old Testament. If you read or study the Old Testament, you will find that it records a lot of the pagan practices of the ancient Israelites. Mythology and the role of mythology. Ancient Israel commingled and synchronistically and creatively reinvented their tradition to accommodate a variety of deities in a variety of ways, in a variety of gradations. This is not even a contested material. You can read any good scholarly book about the religious practices of ancient Israelites, and paganism now is archaeologically, historically a fact. And as I said, it's even documented by some of the Old Testament itself. Jesus comes with the identical message. Your God is one, and there is only but God. As we talked about in previous khutbahs, which I actually quoted, for instance, John chapter 1, verse 5, sorry, John chapter 17, verse 1 to 5. John chapter 17, verse 1 to 5, where Jesus very clearly says, your father and my father is one, and there is only one God. But again, the mythologizing of deity. And as we'll talk about, the Trinity was born through this process of mythology, a different form of paganism, but paganism nonetheless. If we time and time again look at what contributes to the birth of paganistic beliefs, the invention of various agents that mediate and moderate and otherwise negotiate 
the relationship between the created human being and the creator. That is the, essential, the, ess the essence of pagan theology, pagan mythology, the essence of what humanity has done time and time and time and time again is to turn away from the simplicity and purity of the idea of the one and only God, the father of all, the maker of all, to various mythologies that introduce various intermediaries between God, the creator, the one and only, and the created. I referred to this in previous khutbas as the process of divining the mundane or divinating the mundane. You take what is mundane and you attribute divine attributes to that mundane so that it mediates between God and a yeah, human being. Of course, that begs the question, why? Why, from long before even the Prophet Ibrahim from the time we read about Adam, and we don't have time to get into exactly how the narrative of Adam also witnesses the same type of warnings. To a non-biblical prophet like Saleh, but an Islamic prophet like Saleh, or Idris, again, an Arab prophet, To every religious creed that humanity has ever known, the simplicity, simplicity and purity and cleanliness of the monotheistic message, only one God, the God, the supreme of all is consistently time and time again mythologized so that there are various gradations created between the one and only and the mundane. And that, of course, begs the question, why? Remarkably, time and again, we'll find two main elements that play an undeniable role in the corrupting and complicating of the message of Tawheed. Tawheed, that simple, pure, innate idea that there is one and only God. And these two corrupting elements is one, the frailty of the human ego. Human ego is a bundle of contradictions. On the one hand, the human ego is exceptionally narcissistic. It loves to deify itself because the more immature and primitive the ego of a human being is, the more it cannot see the world outside its own particular eyes. It cannot empathize, it cannot project and unite with others. It only sees things through its own singular perception. 
But at the same time that there is d this deep-seated narcissism, the human ego suffers a consistent sense of guilt. Guilt. It elevates itself to selfish heights, but at the same time, it doesn't see itself as worthy of dealing directly with the one and only Creator. So time and again, what human beings do is to say, well, it can't be that I would have a direct relationship with the one and only Allah or God or Yahweh It must be that I connect with something lesser than a full-fledged God that I can relate to. So from the time of Ibrahim, to all the prophets to Muhammad consistently human beings say, is it really true that God cares about me? Is it really true that this all-powerful, immutable, all-knowing God would be open to doing business with me personally as a human being. And that's where mythology comes in to say, well, you can deal with something lesser than a full God. Whether that lesser is called Hubal, al Izza, whether it is bad of the Assyrians, whether it is the Rasta of the Iranians or the Persians, or the various Greek gods, or Jesus of Christianity, it is something that resembles me as a human being that is not fully God. Something that I can interact with as a human being as if God doesn't know suffering unless God suffers. As if God can't absolve sins unless I deal with something in the material world that I can somehow interact with that is lesser than Allah Wahid al Qahar, that is lesser than. Yahweh Akhad, as in Hebrew. That's always the first element. The frailty and inconsistency of the human ego. In Islam, many, instead of building a relationship with Allah, People rely on shiuch. People rely on sharia, on law. People rely on a Sufi master. You negotiate the relationship with Allah. As if you, as a human being, you are not worthy, and as if you don't really believe that God can be interested in you as a human being in all seriousness. As if you are not worthy, but as if also 
you doubt that really God is God. That really God can care and has the ability to care about every individual that God creates. So you need something to intercede that is lesser than. The second element that always comes in to mythologize the message of Tawheed are the corruptions of power. Because the powerful always ache for a level of divinity. We see this throughout history. Today, for instance, to give you just an example of one tyrant, one tyrant. In today's Egypt, and this is just one example, you can cuss God, you can curse the Prophet, you can criticize Islam as much as you want. No one will touch you. But you can't say one word about the Egyptian president. You would be arrested immediately. Well, Sisi, unfortunately, is not atypical for tyrants. It is the standard for tyrants throughout history that ache for a level of divination. So the famous convert to Christianity, Constantine, when he adopted Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire and slaughtered the pagans and persecuted Jews, ached for a religious class of people that would tell the believers obeying the emperor means obeying Jesus Christ. Even till this very day, you find Coptic churches, including the Pope of Egypt, and Bashnoda, says obeying Sisi is obeying God. And that's not the exception. Religious clergy has always played that role of deifying the ruler. In today's Islam, the Islam that has been embraced by Saudi and by the Emirat and by Zaytuna Institute is that the ruler is God's will and you can't defy the ruler. That deification of power is always a factor in the development of the mythologies that corrupt the idea of a singular, all-omnipotent, one and only God. Reclaiming our Islam is reclaiming our Tawheed. But keep in mind, the reason that Tawheed is such is such a troublesome message and a challenging message is that one, it puts a great burden on the individual believer. You really believe in God? You really believe in the one and only? Develop a relationship with one and only. You are worthy if you really believe it. Don't ask for anything or anyone but the one and only, the maker, the creator. Make the creator fall in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have Allah fall in love with you. So many of us say, really? Allah will fall in love with me? I don't need something lesser than Allah to fall in love with me? No, you don't. If you really believe in a single creator that sees all and knows all, if you really believe, because so many of us think we believe, but we don't, 
Then you don't need any more than that. You just stand and you say, Allah, Rabba. You can say Yahweh if you want. You can say whatever. But call Allah. Call upon Allah. And rest assured that Allah will respond. But the second challenge of Tawheed is by its nature, it must challenge those who deify the secular, who make the secular sacred in some form or another. It's like you are with Jesus if you are with Trump. That's deifying the secular. If you obey Assad, you obey God. If you obey Putin, you're obeying God. If you stand with, I forgot his name, the Archdiocese of, of Cyprus, you're with Jesus. Know that when you are called to power, you are called to corruption. When you're called to power, you are called to corruption. If you celebrate with the powerful, you are corrupting Tawheed. If you don't notice the suffering, if you go to any place and you don't notice those who suffer, but notice those who exist in privilege, like right now, there recently, there were these celebrations in Israel for the 25th of December, all these Christians who didn't notice their fellow Palestinian Christians who are suffering. I listened to the sermon given by Palestinian priests and compared it to the celebratory talks given by evangelists and Anglicans in Israel. You can tell who's with God and who's not. That who suffers is with God. That who celebrates with power. That who celebrates with power. Those who are with the white Jesus are with the devil. وسبحان الله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على محمد خاتم النبيين سبحان الله Subhanallah, the type of responses you get from various people who you can easily tell that the mere fact that a Muslim returns the gaze the mere fact that a Muslim knows makes the powerful, makes the privileged, makes the closet, the closet racist, and the closet colonialist who talk about the coming kingdom of God and colonize Palestinian lands under the justification and the guise, oh, well, Jesus is coming, and the kingdom of God is coming, and there will come justice and liberty for a thousand years, but what they don't tell you is that part of this narrative is the slaughter of the so-called army of Antichrist, and you can guess 
Who will? Who is the army of the Antichrist? Can you guess? Muslims. Muslims. And then with his full face, he told me, no, it's not a colonial project. Really? How about the home of the Palestinian that you live in? That was annexed and stolen by the occupying army of Israel and given to you so you can evangelize. How about your images of the slaughter that will befall Muslims in the Middle East before the 1,000th year kingdom of Jesus is to come? I look at these people and I say, shame on you, and shame on your Jesus. But aren't you embarrassed? Aren't you ashamed? You come talk about terrorism and Muslim jihad, and your entire apocalyptic vision for the world is a narrative of terror and murder and extermination. And at that point, and at that point, I say, can I remind you, before you tell me, you know, you're worrying, this is not exactly it, you're not getting it exactly. I say, do you know your Bible? Do you know that narrative about the kingdom of Jesus, which the foundations for which is supposed to be laid out on the premises of what, is, what exists, not in the New Testament, but the Old Testament. Because remember, the Old Testament is a fundamental part of the evangelical belief. Well, here are examples from the Old Testament that we have to look forward to. Numbers, chapters 31, verse 17. Now therefore, kill every male among the little ones, the children, all the little boys, and kill every woman who has shown a man, who has known a man by sleeping with him. Kill every non-version. But all the young girls you have not known, but all the young girls who have not known a man by sleeping with him, keep them alive for yourselves. Take the women captive. Kill the non virgins. Kill all the boys. And keep the virgins to yourself as captive. Deuteronomy. Chapter 20, verse 10. When you draw near to a town to fight against it, offer it terms of peace. If, ex if it accepts your terms of peace and surrenders to you, then all the people in it shall serve you as forced labor. If it does not submit to you peacefully but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives it into your hands, you shall put all its males to the sword, execute all the men. You may, however, take as your booty the women, the children, livestock, and everything else in the town, all its spoil. You may enjoy the spoil of your enemies which the Lord your God has given you. They don't tell you all these evangelicals that were given visas by our governments to go to Iraq and Afghanistan, all the evangelicals that you got to watch on TV on the occasion of the celebrations of the birth of Christ, they don't tell you that it's an intimate part of the coming kingdom of Jesus is to be preceded by the law of Deuteronomy and law of numbers. 
if you go by strict theology, which they base their entire creed on, that must come first. And then you wonder, why is it the Israelis have no qualms about stealing Palestinian lands? Because they consider it spoils of war. The entire territory, the entire land, whether Golan, the West Bank, or Gaza. The Israeli settlers following the Old Testament and the evangelical Christians following the Old and New Testament don't have love for the dark-skinned Palestinian. They don't even notice the dark-skinned Palestinian. They are like the Philistines that Moses slaughtered, according to them, that they, Moses and David slaughtered. They have no rights. They're simply obstacles, impediments to the kingdom of Jesus. This is the stuff they never disclose as they evangelize. This is the stuff they never talk about. It takes a dedicated researcher that reads their commentaries and their historical understanding. I talked about the book called Colonialism, the Bible and Colonialism in the last khutbah. And the Bible played an intimate part in the colonial project. Whether in India, in Africa, or Asia, or South America. And then they talk about Islamic Jihad. You want to compare how many people lost their lives because of jihad to how many people lost their lives because of the law of the Old Testament. And the world wars and the colonial wars. You want to compare the casualty numbers? It is obscene. Obscene. Some people wrote me with some very interesting and funny points. One said, well, do you really know what Yeshua, yeah, Jesus, Yeshua means. That's supposed to be a trick, trick question. Yeshua means Yahweh is salvation. Study your Aramaic. Yeshua, Jesus, means Yahweh is salvation. It amazes me. Christians go around talking about Jesus with everything confirms and affirms that Jesus was but the creature of God, someone that God created, as blessed as Muhammad, as blessed as Ibrahim. But God is God, and Jesus and Muhammad are but crea creations of God. Someone said, well, I read the Bible and I didn't find the Trinity mentioned in there. But then what is, the, where does the Trinity come from? Good question, but a little bit of research would easily reveal the answer. The word Trinity comes from Trinitas or Trias, the set of three. Trinitas means the three. The very first mention of the word Trinity that we are aware of as human beings 
was by a theologian called Tertullian. Tertullian, who died early third century, was the first person to describe that formula of what he understood as the Godhead of Father, Son, Holy Ghost as a trias. And from that, after he used the word Trinity, it was adopted in the Nicaea Council and became the basis that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are one in essence, but not in person. So they're all three equal gods. They're, they're all three eternal, but they're one in essence. What, what does that mean? That's the secret that no one has figured out in all these centuries. And the type of mythology that I talked about at the beginning of the khutbah. Someone asked, how about Matthew chapter 28 verse 19? Doesn't Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 say, baptize me, or talk about baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Doesn't that imply the idea of the Trinity? Yes, but there is a problem with Matthew chapter 8, verse 19. Read Eusebius. Eusebius, who is one of the most famous Christian theologians, one of the fathers of Christian doctrine, died in the 4th century says that the original text of the Bible didn't say baptize in the Father of, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, but said baptize in my name God. That was the original text before the Council of Nicaea. And the Manuscripts we found in Qumran and the manuscripts that came out of Sina, the so-called Sinaitic manuscripts, and the manuscripts that exist in Rome similarly do not say baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, but simply says baptize in the name of, the, of, the, of God, the one and only. The reason I respond to these questions is that I know that Muslims, that Muslims will have no clue because Muslims have not awoken up to the fact that we live in an information age where education makes all the difference. Where Tawheed is more important the one and only God, is more important than any time in human history. That it is the only thing that cleanses the human ego so that it knows at the same time that it is simultaneously, that is worthy, it is worthy, it is important, every human being, has rights as an entitled to all, all dignity, and all value, and that from God directly, without any intercession, without mythology, and that unless religion stands up to the corruptions of power, unless religion is in the side of the oppressed and suffering, not on the side of the powerful. 
then religion will be, will be and, and will continue to be another instrument of oppression and corruption on earth. Muslims have a critical role to play if they can reclaim their Tawheed. And if they can answer the simple, obvious questions, when Christians especially, especially, come and say, Muslims don't understand the Trinity. Well, neither do you. <laughs> you, you don't understand the Trinity. You call it a mystery. What's his name that went to say, well, the Trinity is like Shamra, Shamrock Leaf, the, the, uh, the, the famous saint that introduced Christianity to Ireland. said, well, it's like, like the Shamrock Leaf. You know, it has three parts, but it's one. Yeah, but can any part of these leaves exist independently? You say that the Holy Ghost, the Son, and the Father is separate and apart. Eternal. I'll close with this. Some time ago, I wasted my time by reading a book called The Shack. The Shack is a story about a man, his daughter is abducted, raped, and killed, and he loses faith in God. And then God comes to this man and says, come live with me, the Godhead, and I'll explain to you the mysteries. And so in the story, there is a woman cooking, there is a man cleaning, and there is a guy working in the garden, and the father of the murdered girl says, look, this is God. And of course what they do is that the woman serves the man, and the guy who's cleaning gives the man a massage, and the guy who's working in the garden gives him flowers, and they say, see, we are the Father, the Holy Ghost, and the Son. The book was stupid. <laughs> this is your conception of God? Your God has to be a pamper that you wear so that when you soil yourself, you have that something that cleans it up for you because you are not man enough to take responsibility for your own personhood and dignity, and identity, and stand before God as a true child of God, saying, I don't need you to serve me meals, I don't need you to give me flowers, I don't need you to give me massages, I don't need you to split yourself into three, and definitely, I don't need you to commit the crime of torture, because God, the Father, sends His Son to be crucified, tortured, spat on, insulted. I tell evangelicals, it's a brutal, cruel God. If God can do this to His own Son, then how about us? What are you talking about? Are you insane? Ah, oh, well, you don't really understand. Okay, well, if with everything I've read, and I've, and all the, the, then I doubt anyone can. Muslims live up to your promise, live up to your faith. Allah has given you what Allah has given Adam and Eve. Adam Hawa. Allah has given you what Allah has given the prophets before Ibrahim. Allah has given you what Allah has given Ibrahim, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, alayhum salam, Adonai Rahim, Adonai Akhad. So, I, so that I say it in Hebrew, maybe you'll be impressed. Allah is one. God is one. And there is no God but God. Allahumma
اللهم ارحمنا واغفر لنا يا علي العظيم واهدنا لاقرب من هذا رشدا الله forgive our sins grant us wisdom perception light and love grant us the straight path so that we may always find you and be one with you we are Allah